Okay. Oh, is this recording? It is. <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, I am Sass Litigan with Resources for Organizing and Social Change. Um, we are going into, I believe it's the 10th chapter of Parable of the Sower this week. Um, I'm going to have a screen share here for people who process better through reading. Um, and I also want to give a content warning right up front um, for folks who uh, have a hard time hearing uh, descriptions of like graphic violence or sexual assault. Um, this story has a lot of that. Um, I'm going to start off with a recap uh, from last week's reading and a little bit of like what what we've learned so far in the story and then we will get going. Um, I did back up just a little bit from where I ended last week so that there would be some cohesion in what I read because I kind of like left off in the middle of a page. So um, with that said, we will start with our recap. So our story, um, the whole story began in the year 2024 in a suburb just outside of LA called Robledo. Um, and it's a post-apocalyptic time in the world where um, environmental degradation is seen through climate change. It's like so hot. Um, the temperature has risen so much that on a sunny day, it's really difficult to be outside and breathe. Um, crime and suffering are the norm. Violence and witnessing death is expected. Um, our protagonist, whose name is Lauren, is a teen who um, struggles in the story because she has a condition called hyperempathy. Um, which causes her to physically and emotionally experience the pain and pleasure of people around her. Um, also, I'm like looking down because I have notes that I'm looking at. Um, she lives with her father and stepmom in a Walden community where just outside the community are people who are robbing folks and killing folks and raping. And um, it's like really scary outside of her community. Um, and emergency services like the fire department and the police cost a ton of money. So even if something were happening, it would be unlikely that they would call emergency services and um, potable water is also really expensive. Um, so last week, um, we continued through the year 2025. Um, Lauren ends up turning 16 in uh, throughout that year um, and she continues to ponder what God really is um, and she rejects traditional ideas that are um, taught by her father who is a pastor. Um, we also get to see what she thinks of in terms of uh, being needed for survival um, because the chapter that we started on chapter seven began with her um, creating a survival pack, which if you've been following along with us, you might remember that she was really trying to encourage people that she cared about to like be prepared for survival, um, despite the community feeling like she was like scaring people needlessly. Um, we find out while she's packing this bag that she's got almost a thousand dollars in cash and that it will feed her um, for just a couple of weeks. Um, we also start to get to know her younger brother, Keith, who is 13 years old um, and is feeling really upset about not being able to own a gun or going um, target shooting. Um, eventually, Keith gets so frustrated by feeling like he's older than his age um, that he ends up actually taking off and leaving um, actually leaving their Walden community for a day. And when he finally arrives back, he's like stripped down to his underwear. He's like bruised and bleeding and like clearly shaking. Um, and the key that he had for their house was stolen while he was gone. Um, and his father is just like super, super upset that he even chose to leave. Um, and there's like a lot of fighting between her father and her stepmom. Um, she, and, and for those who weren't following along to begin with, she lives with her dad and her stepmom. Her mom um, passed away while she was giving birth to her. Um, so uh, Keith ends up deciding to leave yet again. Um, and when he does, 
he leaves and is like gone and nobody knows where he went. Days are going by. Nobody's heard from him. Um, Lauren's father is going out daily, leaving the community, looking for him. Um, he's coming back at night and Lauren's stepmom, whose name is Corey, is really upset um, with Lauren's dad for not finding him. She's feeling like um, he's just not trying hard enough. Um, and at eventually um, Keith is assumed to be dead. And um, that assumption is like compounded by the fact that uh, one of Lauren's neighbors earlier in the chapter had gone missing and was not found at any point. Um, eventually, however, Keith shows back up to the house and he's actually unscathed and he has money with him that he plans to give to the family. Um, and Lauren's father um, just becomes absolutely just beside himself with upset because he had been risking his life day after day looking for him, unable to find him, and then coming home and, and fighting um, with Corey every night about it. Um, and throughout this, Lauren is finding herself having to take on the role of family patriarch, or matriarch rather, um, because uh, Corey is just like a total mess. Uh, Keith is the favorite child according to Lauren's perceptions and um, Corey is just like not dealing with him being missing well at all. Um, and so where we left off uh, last week was right in the beginning of 2026. Um, and Keith at this point has basically decided he's not going to live at home anymore. Um, because when he did eventually show back up, Lauren's father just like, be, you know, went into a rage and ended up really beating him really badly. Um, and so he, he tells his mom, like, he's not going to stay there for that. Um, which brings us to today. So, here we go. 2026, civilization is to groups what intelligence is to individuals. It is a means of combining the intelligence of many to achieve ongoing group adaptation. Civilization, like intelligence, may serve well, serve adequately, or fail to serve its adaptive function. When civilization fails to serve, it must disintegrate unless it is acted upon by unifying internal or external forces. Earthseed, the books of the living. Wait a minute here. Pull the book a little behind me. Chapter 10. When apparent stability disintegrates, as it must, God is change. People tend to give in to fear and depression, to need and greed, when no influence is strong enough to unify people they divide. They struggle one against one, group against group for survival, position, power. They remember old hates and generate new, uh, and generate new ones. They create chaos and nurture it. They kill and kill and kill until they are exhausted and destroyed, until they are conquered by outside forces, or until one of them becomes a leader most will follow or a tyrant most will fear. Earthseed, the books of the living. Thursday, June 25th, 2026. Keith came home yesterday bigger than ever, as tall and lean as dad is, tall and broad. He's not quite 14, but he already looks like the man he wants so much to be. We're like that, we Olaminas, tall, sturdy, fast-growing people. Except for Gregory, who is only nine, we all tower over Corey. I'm still the tallest, but my height seems to annoy her these days. She loves Keith's size, though, her big son. She just hates the fact that he doesn't live with us anymore. I got a room, he said to me yesterday. We talked, he and I. Corey was with Dorothea Cruz, who is one of her best friends and who had just had another baby. The other boys were playing in the street and on the island. 
Dad had gone to the college and would be gone overnight. Now, more than ever, it's safest to go out just at dawn and not to try coming home until just at dawn the next morning. That's if you have to go outside at all, which dad does about once a week. The worst parasites still prowl at night and sleep late into the morning, yet Keith lives outside. I got a room in a building with some other people, he said. Translation? He and his friends were squatting in an abandoned building. Who were his friends? A gang? A flock of prostitutes? A, a bunch of astronauts flying high on drugs? A den of thieves? all of the above. Whenever he came to see us, he brought money to Corey and little gifts to Bennett and Gregory. How could he get money? There's no honest way. Do your friends know how old you are, I asked. He grinned. Hell no. Why should I tell them that? I nodded. It does help to look older sometimes. You want something to eat? You gonna cook for me? I've cooked for you hundreds of times, thousands. I know, but you always had to before. Don't be stupid. You think I couldn't act the way you did? Skip out on my responsibilities if I felt like it? I don't feel like it. You want to eat or not? Sure. I made, I made rabbit stew and acorn bread. Enough for Corey and all the boys when they came in. He hung around and watched me work for a while, then began to talk to me. He's never done that before. We've never, never liked each other, he and I. But he had information I wanted, and he seemed to want to talk. I must have been the safest person he could talk to. He wasn't afraid of shocking me. He didn't much care what I thought. And he wasn't afraid I'd tell Dad or Corey anything, he said. Of course I wouldn't. Why cause them pain? I've never been much for tattling on people anyway. It's just a nasty old building on the outside, he was saying of his new home. You wouldn't believe how great it looks once you go in, though. Whorehouse or spaceship, I asked. It's got stuff like you never saw, he evaded. TV windows you go through instead of just sitting and looking at. Headsets, belts, and torch, torch rings. You see and feel everything, do anything, anything. There's places and things you can get into with that equipment that are insane. You don't ever have to go into the street except to get food. And whoever owns this stuff you took, uh, who, and whoever owns this stuff took you in, I asked. Yeah, why? He looked at me for a long time, then started to laugh. Because I can read and write, he said at last, and none of them can. They're all older than me, but not one of them can read or write anything. They stole all this great stuff, and they couldn't even use it. Before I got there, they even broke some of it because they couldn't read the instructions. Corey and I had had a hell of a struggle teaching him to read and write. He had been bored and patient, anything but eager. So you read for a living. Help your new friends learn to use their stolen equipment, I said. Yeah. And what else? Nothing else. What a piss poor liar he is. Always was. He's got no conscience. He just isn't smart enough to tell convincing lies. Drugs, Keith, I asked. Prostitution? Robbery? I said nothing else. You always think you know everything. I sighed. You're not done causing Dad and Corey pain, are you? Not by a long shot. He looked as though he wanted to shout back at me or hit me. He might have done one or the other if I hadn't mentioned Corey. I don't give a shit about him, he said, his voice low and ugly. He had a man's voice already. He had everything but a man's brain. I do more for her than he does. I bring her money and nice things and my friends. My friends know she lives here, and then and then they and so they leave this place alone. He's nothing. I turned and looked at him and saw my father and saw my father's face, lighter skinned, younger, thinner, but my father's face unmistakable. He's you, I whispered. Every time I look at you, I see him. Every time you look at him, you see yourself. Dog shit. I shrugged. 
It was a long time before he spoke again. At last, he said, did he ever hit you? Not for about five years. Why'd he hit you back then? I thought about that and decided to tell him. He was old enough. He caught me and Reuben Quintanilla in the bushes together. Keith shouted with abrupt laughter. You and Reuben, really? You were doing it with him? You're kidding. We were 12, what the hell? You're lucky you didn't get pregnant. I know, 12 can be a dumb age. He looked away. But he didn't beat you as bad as he beat me. He sent you boys over to play with the Talcotts. I gave him a glass of cold orange juice and poured one for myself. I don't remember, he said. You were nine, I said. Nobody was going to tell you what was going on. As I remember, I told you I fell down the back steps. He frowned, perhaps remembering. My face had been memorable. Dad hadn't beaten me as badly as he beat Keith, but I looked worse. He should remember that. He ever beat up Mama? I shook my head. No, I've never seen any sign of it. I don't think he would. He loves her, you know, he really does. Bastard, he's our father and he's the best man I know. Did you think that when he beat you? No, but later when I figured out how stupid I'd been, I was just glad he was so strict. And back when it happened, I was just glad he didn't quite kill me. He laughed again twice in just a few minutes and both times at things I'd said. Maybe he was ready to open up a little now. Tell me about the outside, I said. How do you live out there? He drained the last of his second glass of juice. I told you, I live real good out there. But how did you live when you first went out, when you went out to stay? He looked at me and smiled. He smiled like that years ago when he used red ink to trick me into, ble into bleeding and empathy with a wound that he didn't have. I remember that particular nasty smile. You want to go out yourself, don't you? He demanded. Someday. What, instead of marrying Curtis and having a bunch of babies? Yeah, instead of that. I wondered why you were being so nice to me. The food smelled just about ready. So I got up and took the bread from the oven and bowls from the cupboard. I was tempted to tell him to dish up his own stew, but I knew he would spoon all of the meat out of the stew and leave nothing but potatoes and vegetables for the rest of us. So I served him and myself, covered the pot, left it on the lowest possible fire, and put a towel over the bread. I let him eat in peace for a while, though I thought the boys would be coming in at any time now, starving. Then I was afraid to wait any longer. Talk to me, Keith, I said. I really want to know, how did you survive when you first went out there? His smile this time was less evil. Maybe the food had mellowed him. I slept in a cardboard box for the first three days and stole food, he said. I don't know why I kept going back to that box. Could have slept in any old corner. Some kids carry a piece of cardboard to sleep on so they won't be right down on the ground, you know. Then I got a sleep sack from an old man. It was new, like he never used it. Then I, you stole it? He gave me a look of scorn. What, you think, what you think I was going to do? I didn't have no money. Just had that gun, Mama's 38. Yes, he had brought it back to her three visits ago, along with two boxes of ammunition. Of course, he never sad, said how he got the ammunition or how he got his replacement gun a Heckler and Coke 9mm, just like Dad's. He just showed up with things and claimed that if you had the money, you could buy anything outside. He had never admitted how he got the money. Okay, I said. So you stole a sleep sack, and you kept stealing food. It's a wonder you didn't get caught. The old guy had some money. I used it to buy food. Then I started walking toward L.A. The old dream of his. For reasons that make sense to him alone, he's always wanted to go to L.A. Any sane person would be thankful for the 20 miles that separate us from that oozing sore. There's people all over the freeway coming from L.A., he said. There's even people wa uh, walking up fr from way down in San Diego. 
they don't know where they're going. I talked to this guy. He, he said that he was going to Alaska. God damn Alaska. Good luck to him, I said. He's got a lot of guns to face before he gets there. He won't get there. Alaska must be a thousand miles from here. I nodded. More than that, and with hostile state lines and borders along the way. But good luck to him anyhow. It's a goal that makes sense. He had $23,000 in his pack. I didn't say anything. I just froze, stared at him in disgust and renewed dislike. But of course, of course. You wanted to know, he said. That's what it's like outside. If you got a gun, you're somebody. If you don't, you shit. And a lot of people out there don't have guns. I thought most of them did, except the ones too poor to be worth robbing. I thought so too, but guns cost a lot and it's easier to get one if you already got one, you know? What if that Alaska guy had had one? You'd be dead. I snuck up on him while he was sleeping, just sort of followed him until he went off, to the, went off the road to go to sleep. Then I got him. He led me away from LA though. You shot him? The nasty smile again. He talked to you, he was friendly to you, and you shot him? What was I supposed to do, wait for God to come and give me some money? What was I supposed to do? Come home? Shit. Doesn't it even bother you that you took someone's life? You killed a man. He seemed to think about that for a while. Then he shook his head. It don't bother me, he said. I was scared at first, but then after I did it, I didn't feel nothing. Nobody saw me do it. I just took his stuff and left him there. Besides, maybe he wasn't dead. People don't always die just because you shoot them. You didn't check? I just wanted his stuff. He was crazy anyway. Alaska. I didn't say any more to him. Didn't ask any more questions. He talked a little about meeting some guys and joining up with them. Then discovering that even though they were all older than he was, none of them could read or write. He was a help to them. He made their lives pleasanter. Maybe that's why they didn't just wait until he was asleep and kill him and take his loot for themselves. After a while, he noticed that I wasn't saying anything and he laughed. You better marry Curtis and make babies, he said. Out there, outside, you wouldn't last a day. That hyper-empathy shit of yours would bring you down even if nobody touched you. You think that, I said. Hey, I saw a guy get both of his eyes gouged out. After that, they set him on fire and watched him run around and scream and burn. You think you could stand to see that? You knew friends did that, I asked? Hell no. Crazies did that. Paints. They shave off all their hair, even their eyebrows, and they paint their skin green or blue or red or yellow. They eat fire and kill rich people. They do what? They take that drug that makes them like to watch fires, sometimes a campfire or a trash fire or a house fire, or sometimes they grab a rich guy and set him on fire. Why? I don't know. They're crazy. I heard some of them used to be rich kids, so I don't know why they hate rich people so much. That drug is bad, though. Sometimes the paints like the fire so much that they get too close to it. Then their friends don't even help them. They just watch them burn. It's like, I don't know, it's like they were fucking the fire and, and like it was the best fuck they ever had. You never tried it. Hell no. I told you, those guys are crazy. You know, even the girls shave their heads. Damn, they look ugly. They're mostly kids then? Yeah, your age up to maybe 20. There's a few old ones, 25, even 30. I hear most of them don't live that long, though. Corey and the boys came in at that moment. Gregory and Bennett excited because their side in soccer had won. Corey was happy and wistful, talking to Marcus about Dorothea Cruz's new baby girl. Things changed when they all saw Keith, of course, but the evening wasn't too bad. Keith had presents for the little boys, of course, and money for Corey and nothing for Marcus and me. This time, though, he was a little shamefaced with me. Maybe I'll bring you something next time, he said. No, don't, I said, thinking of the Alaska-bound traveler. It's all right. I don't want anything. He shrugged and turned to talk to Corey. Monday, 
July 20th, 2026. Keith came to see me today just before dark. He found me walking home from the Talcott house where Curtis had been wishing me a very happy birthday. We'd been very careful, Curtis and I, but from somewhere or other, he'd gotten a supply of condoms. They're old fashioned, but they work. And there's an unused dark room in a corner of the Talcott garage. Keith scared me out of a very sweet mood. He came from behind two houses without making a sound. He had almost reached me before I realized someone was there and turned to face him. He raised his hand, smiling. Bought you a birthday present, he said. He put something into my left hand. Money. Keith, no, give it to Corey. You give it to her. You want her to have it, you give it to her. I gave it to you. I walked him to the gate, concerned that one of the watchers might spot him and shoot him. He was that much taller than he had been when he stopped living with us. Dad was home, so he couldn't come in. I thanked him for the money and told him I would give it to Corey. I wanted him to know that because I didn't want him to bring me anything else, ever. He seemed not to mind. He kissed the side of my face and said, happy birthday, and went out. He still had Corey's key, and although Dad knew that he had it, he hadn't had the lock changed again. Wednesday, August 26th, 2026. Today, my parents had to go downtown to identify the body of my brother, Keith. Saturday, August 29th. 2026. I haven't been able to write a word since Wednesday. I don't know what to write. The body was Keith's. I, I never saw it, of course. Dad said that he tried to keep Corey from seeing it. The things someone had done to Keith before he died. I don't want to write about this, but I need to. Sometimes writing about a thing makes it easier to stand. Someone had cut and burned away most of my brother's skin. Everywhere, except for his face. They burned out his eyes, but they left the rest of his face intact, like they wanted him to be recognized. They cut and they cauterized and they cut and they cauterized. Some of the wounds were days old. Someone had an endless hatred for my brother. Dad got us all together and described to us what had been done. He told it in a flat, dead monotone. He wanted to scare us, to scare Marcus, Bennett, and Gregory in particular. He wanted us to understand just how dangerous the outside is. The police said that drug dealers torture people the way that Keith was tortured. They torture people who steal from them and people who compete with them. We don't know whether Keith was doing either of those things. We just know that he's dead. His body was dumped across town from here, from here in front of a burned out old building that was once a nursing home. It was dumped on the broken concrete and abandoned several hours after Keith had died. It could have been dumped in one of the canyons and only the dogs would have found it, but someone wanted it to be found, wanted it to be recognized. Had one of his victims, relatives or friends managed to get even at last? The police seemed to think we should know who killed him. I got the feeling from their questions that they would have been happy to arrest Dad or Corey or both of them, but they both led very public lives and neither had any unexplained absences or other breaks in routine. Dozens of people could give them alibis. Of course, I said nothing about what Keith had told me he had been doing. What good would that do? He was dead and in a horrible way. By accident or by intent, all his victims were avenged. Wardell Parrish felt called upon to tell the police about the big fight that Dad and Keith had had last year. He'd heard it, of course. Half the neighborhood had heard it. Family fights are neighborhood theater, and Dad the minister, after all. I know Wardell Parrish was the one who told the cops. His youngest niece, Tanya, let that much slip. Uncle Ward said that he hated to mention it, but... Oh, I'll bet he hated to mention it, damned bastard, but nobody backed him up. The cops went nosing around the neighborhood, but no one else admitted knowing anything about a fight. After all, they knew Dad didn't kill Keith. 
and they knew that the cops liked to solve cases by discovering evidence against whomever they decided must be guilty. Best to give them nothing. They never helped when people called for help. They came later, and more often than not, made a bad situation worse. We had the service today. Dad asked his friend, Reverend Robinson, to take care of it. Dad just sat with Corey and the rest of us and looked bent and old, so old. Corey cried all day, most of the time without making a sound. She's been crying off and on since Wednesday. Marcus and Dad tried to comfort her. Even I tried, though the way she looked at me, as though I had something to do with Keith's death, as though she almost hated as as though she almost hated me. I keep reaching out to her. I don't know what else to do. Maybe in time she'll be able to forgive me for not being her daughter, for being alive when her son is dead, for being dad's daughter by someone else I don't know. Dad never shed a tear. I've never seen him cry in my life. Today, I wish he would. I wish he could. Curtis Talcott sort of hung around with me today, and we talked and talked. I guess I needed to talk, and Curtis was willing to put up with me. He said that I should cry. He said no matter how bad things had gotten between Keith and me, or Keith and the family, I should let myself cry. Odd. Until he brought it up. I hadn't thought about my own absence of tears. I hadn't cried at all. Maybe Corey had noticed. Maybe my dry face was just one more grudge that she held against me. It wasn't that I was holding back and being stoic. It's just that I hated Keith at least as much as I loved him. He was my brother, a half-brother, but he was also the most sociopathic person I've ever been close to. He would have been a monster if he had been allowed to grow up. Maybe he was one already. He never cared what he did. If he wanted to do something and it wouldn't cause him immediate physical pain, he did it. Fuck the earth. He messed up our family. He broke it into something less than a family. Still, I would never have wished him dead. I would never wish anyone dead in a horrible way. I think he was killed by monsters much worse than himself. It's beyond me how one human could, how one human being could do that to another. If hyperempathy syndrome were a more common complaint, people couldn't do such things. They could kill if they had to and bear the pain of it or be destroyed by it. But if everyone could feel everyone else's pain, who would torture? Who would cause anyone unnecessary pain? I've never thought of my problem as something that might do some good before, but the way things are, I think it would help. I wish I could give it to people. Failing that, I wish I could find other people who have it and live among them. A biological conscience is better than no conscience at all. But as for me crying, if I were going to cry, I think I would have done it back when Dad beat Keith. When the beating was over and Dad saw what he had done and we all saw how both Keith and Corey looked at him. I knew then that neither of them would ever forgive him. Not ever. That was the end of something precious in the family. I wish Dad could cry for his son, but I don't feel any need at all to cry for my brother. May he rest in peace, in his urn, in heaven, wherever. Chapter 11. Any change may bear seeds of benefit. Seek them out. Any change may bear seeds of harm. Beware. God is, in, is infinitely malleable. God is change. Earthseed, the Books of the Living. Saturday, October 17th, 2026. We are coming apart. The community, the families, individual family members, we're a rope breaking a single strand at a time. There was another robbery last night, or an attempted robbery. I wish that was all. No garden theft this time. Three guys came over the wall and crowbarred their way into the Cruz house. The Cruz family, of course, has loud burglar alarms, barred windows, and security gates at all the doors, just like the rest of us. But that doesn't seem to matter. When people want to come in, they come in. The thieves used simple hand tools, crowbars, hydraulic jacks, maybe anyone can get. 
I didn't know how they disabled the burglar alarm. I know they cut the electrical and phone lines to the house. That shouldn't have mattered since the alarm had backup batteries. Whatever else they did or whatever went wrong, the alarm didn't go off. And after the thieves used the crowbars on the door, they walked into the kitchen and used it on Dorothea Cruz's 75-year-old grandmother. The old lady was a light sleeper and had gotten into the habit of getting up at night and brewing herself a cup of lemongrass tea. Her family says that that's what she was coming into the kitchen to do when the thieves broke in. Then, Dorothea's brothers, Hector and Reuben uh, Quintanilla, came running, guns in hand. They had the bedroom nearest to the kitchen and they heard all of the noise, the break in itself and Mrs. Quintanilla being knocked against the kitchen table and chairs. They killed two of the thieves. The third got away, perhaps wounded. There was a lot of blood, but old Mrs. Quintanilla was dead. This is the seventh incident since Keith was killed. More and more people are coming over our wall to take what we have or what they think we have. Seven intrusions into house or garden and less than two months in an 11 household community. If this is what's happening to us, what must it be like for people who are really rich? Although perhaps with their big guns and private armies of security guards and up-to-date security equipment, they're better able to fight back. Maybe that's why we're getting so much attention. We have a few stealables and we're not that well protected. Of the seven intrusions, three were successful. Thieves got in and out with something, a couple of radios, a sack of walnuts, wheat flour, cornmeal, pieces of jewelry, an ancient TV, a computer. If they could carry it, they made off with it. If what Keith told me is true, we're getting the poorer class of thieves here. No doubt the tougher, smarter, more courageous thieves hit stores and businesses. But our lower class thugs are killing us slowly. Next year, I'll be 18, old enough, according to dad, to stand a regular night watch. I wish I could do it now. As soon as I can do it, I will, but it won't be enough. It's funny. Corey and dad have been using some of the money that Keith brought us to help the people who've been robbed. Stolen money to help victims of theft. Half the money is hidden in our backyard in case of disaster. There's always been some money hidden out there. Now there's enough to make a difference. The other half has gone into the church fund to help our neighbors in emergencies. It won't be enough. Tuesday, October 20th, 2026. Something new is beginning, or perhaps something old and nasty is reviving. A company called Kagam Kagamoto, Stam, Frampton, and Company, KSF, has taken over the running of a small coastal city called Olivar. Olivar Incorporated in the 1980s is just one more beach bedroom suburb of Los Angeles, small and well-to-do. It has little industry, much hilly vacant land, and a short crumbling coastline. Its people, like some here in our Robledo neighborhood, earn salaries that would have once made them prosperous and comfortable. In fact, Olivar is a lot richer than we are, but since it's a coastal city, its taxes are higher, and since some of its land is unstable, it has extra problems. Parts of it sometimes crumble into the ocean, undercut or deeply saturated by salt water. Sea levels keep rising with the warming climate, and there is the occasional earthquake. Olivar's flat, sandy beach is already just a memory. So are the houses and businesses that used to sit on that beach, like coastal cities all over the world. Olivar needs special help. It's an upper middle class, white, literate community of people who once had a lot of weight to throw around. Now, not even the politicians it's helped to elect will stand by it. The whole state, the country, the world needs help, it's been told. What the hell is tiny Olivar whining about? Somewhat richer and less geologically active communities are getting help. Dikes, seawalls, evacuation assistance, whatever is appropriate. Olivar, located between the sea and Los Angeles, is getting an influx of salt water from one direction and desperate poor people from the other. It has a solar-powered 
dis, uh, desalination plant on some of its flatter, more stable land, and that provides its people with a dependable supply of water. But it can't protect itself from the encroaching sea, the crumbling earth, the crumbling economy, or the desperate refugees. Even getting back and forth to work for those few who can't work at home was becoming as dangerous for them as it is for our people, a kind of terrible gauntlet that has, uh, that has to be run over and over again. Then the people of KSF showed up. After many promises, much haggling, suspicion, fear, hope, and legal wrangling, the voters and the officials of Olivar permitted their own town to be taken over, bought out, and privatized. KSF will expand the, diesel, the desalination plant to vast size. That plant will be the first of many. The company intends to dominate farming and the selling of water and solar and wind energy over much of the Southwest, where for pennies it's already bought vast tracts of fertile, of fertile waterless land. So far, Olivar is one of its smaller coastal holdings, but with Olivar, it gets an eager, educated workforce, people with a few years older than, who are a few years older than I am, whose options are very limited. And there's all that formerly public land that they now control. They mean to own great water power and agricultural industries in an area that most people have given up on. They have long-term plans and the people of Olivar have decided to become part of them, to accept smaller salaries that their socioeconomic group is used to in exchange for security, a guaranteed food supply, jobs, and help in their battle with the Pacific. There are still people in Olivar who are uncomfortable with the change. They know about early American company towns in which the companies cheated and abused people, but this is to be different. The people of Olivar aren't frightened, impoverished victims. They're able to look after themselves, their rights, and their property. They're educated people who don't want to live in the spreading chaos of the rest of Los Angeles County. Some of them said so on the radio documentary we all listened to last night, as they made a public spectacle of selling themselves to KSF. Good luck to them, Dad said. Not that they'll have much luck in the long run. What do you mean, Corey demanded. I think the whole idea is wonderful. It's what we need. Now if only some big company would want to do the same thing with Robledo. No, Dad said. Thank God, no. You don't know. Why shouldn't they? Robledo's too big, too poor, too black, and too Hispanic to be of interest to anyone. And it has no coastline. What it does have is street poor, body dumps, and a memory of once being well off of shade trees, big houses, hills, and canyons. Most of those things are still here, but no company will want us. At the end of the program, it was announced that KSF was looking, looking for registered nurses, credentialed teachers, and a few other skilled professionals who would be willing to move to Olivar and work for room and board. The offer wasn't put that way, of course, but that's what it meant. Yet Corey recorded the phone number and called it at once. She and dad are both teachers, both PhDs. She was desperate to get in ahead of the crowd. Dad just shrugged and let her call. Roman board. They offered salaries. The offered salaries were so low that if dad and Corey both worked, they wouldn't earn as much as dad is earning now with the college. And out of it, they'd have to pay rent as well as the usual expenses. In fact, when you add everything up, it's clear that with the six of us, they couldn't earn enough to meet expenses. It might work if I could find a job of some kind, but in Olivar, they don't need me. They've got hundreds of me at least, maybe thousands. Every surviving community is full of unemployed, half-educated kids or unemployed, un uneducated kids. Anyone KSF hired would have a hard time living on the salary offered. In not very much time, I think the new hires would be in debt to the company. That's an old company town trick. Get people into debt, hang on to them, and work them harder. Debt slavery. That might work in Christopher Donner's America, 
labor laws, state and federal, are not what they once were. We could try, Corey insisted to dad. We could be safe in all of our. The kids could go to a real school and later get jobs with the company. After all, where can they go from here except outside? Dad shook his head. Don't hope for it, Corey. There's nothing safe about slavery. Marcus and I were still up listening. The two younger boys had been sent to bed, but we four were still clustered around the radio. Now Marcus spoke up. Olivar doesn't sound like slavery, he said. Those rich people would never let themselves be slaves. Dad gave him a sad smile. Not now, he said. Not at first, he said. Kagamoto, Stam, Frampton, Japanese, German, Canadian. When I was young, people said it would come to this. Well, why shouldn't other countries buy what's left of us if we put it up for sale? I wonder how many of the people in Olivar have any idea what they're doing. I don't think many do, I said. I don't think they dare let themselves know. He looked at me and I looked back. I'm still learning how dogged people can be in denial, even when their freedom or their lives are at stake. He's lived with it longer. I wonder how. Marcus said, Lauren, you ought to want to go to some places, some place like Oliver more than anyone. You share pain every time you see someone get hurt. There'd be a lot less pain in Oliver. And there would be all those guards, I said. I've noticed that people who have a little bit of power tend to use it. All those guards KSF is bringing in. They won't be allowed to bother the rich people, at least at first. But new bare bones work for room and board employees? I bet they'll be fair game. There's no reason to believe the company would allow that kind of thing, Corey said. Why do you always expect the worst of everything, of everyone? When it comes to strangers with guns, I told her, I think suspicion is more likely to keep you alive than trust. She made a sharp, wordless sound of disgust. <sighs> you know nothing about the world. You think you have all the answers, but you know nothing. I didn't argue. There wasn't much point in my arguing with her. I doubt that Oliver is looking for families of Blacks and Hispanics anyway, Dad said. The Baders or the Garfields or even some of the Duns might get in, but I don't think we would. Even if I were trusting enough to put my family into KSF's hands, they wouldn't have us. We could try it, Corey insisted. We should. We wouldn't want to be any worse off than we are now if they turn, we wouldn't be any worse off than we are now if they turn us down. And if we got in and we didn't like it, we could come back here. We could rent the house to one of the big families here. Charge, excuse me, charge them just a little, then... Then come back here jobless and penniless, Dad said. No, I mean it. This business sounds half antebellum revival and half science fiction. I don't trust it. Freedom is dangerous, Corey, but it's precious, too. You can't just throw it away or let it slip away. You can't sell it for bread and pottage. Corey stared at him, just stared. He refused to look away. Corey got up and went to their bedroom. I saw, her, I saw her there a few minutes later, sitting on the bed, cradling the urn of Keith's ashes and crying. Saturday, October 24th, 2026. Marcus tells me that the Garfields are trying to get into Olivar. He's been spending a lot of time with Robin Bader and she told him. She hates the idea because she likes her cousin Joanne a lot better than she does her two sisters. She's afraid that if Joanne goes away to Olivar, she'll never see her again. I suspect she's right. I can't imagine this place without the Garfields. Joanne, Jay, uh, Felita. We've lost individuals before, of course, but we've never lost a whole family. I mean, they'll be alive, but they'll be gone. I hope they're refused. I know it's selfish, but I don't care. Not that it makes any difference what I hope. Oh, hell. I hope they get whatever will be best for their survival. I hope they'll be all right. At 13, my brother Marcus has become the only person in the family whom I would call beautiful. Girls at, girls at, <laughs> girls his age stare at him when they think he's not looking. They giggle a lot around him and chase him like crazy, but he sticks to Robin. She's not pretty at all, all skin and bones and brains. 
but she's funny and sensible. In a year or two, she'll start to fill out and my brother will get beauty along with all those brains. Then, if the two of them are still together, their lives will get a lot more interesting. I've changed my mind. I used to wait for the explosion, the big crash, the sudden chaos that would destroy the neighborhood. Instead, things are unraveling, disintegrating bit by bit. Susan Talcott Bruce and her husband have applied to Olivar. Other people are talking about applying, thinking about it. There's a small college in Olivar. There are lethal security devices to keep thugs and street poor out. There are more jobs opening up. Maybe Olivar is the future, one face of it. Cities controlled by big companies that are old hat and science fiction. My grandmother left a whole bookcase of old science fiction novels. The company city subgenre always seemed to star a hero who outsmarted, overthrew, or escaped the company. I've never seen one where the hero fought like hell to get taken in and underpaid by the company. In real life, that's the way it will be. That's the way it is. And what should I be doing? What can I do? In less than a year, I'll be 18, an adult. An adult with no prospects except life in our disintegrating neighborhood, or Earthseed. To begin Earthseed, I'll have to go outside. I've known that for a long time, but the idea scares me just as much as it always has. Next year, when I'm 18, I'll go. That means now I have to begin to plan how I'll handle it. Saturday, October 31st, 2026. I'm going to go north. My grandparents once traveled a lot by car. They left, they left us old road maps of just about every county in the state, plus several of other parts of the country. The newest of them is 40 years old, but that doesn't matter. The roads will still be there. They'll just be in worse shape than they were back when my grandparents drove a gas-fueled car over them. I've put maps of the California counties north of us and the few I could find of Washington and Oregon counties into my pack. I wonder if there are people outside who will pay me to teach them reading and writing, basic stuff, or people who will pay me to read or write for them. Keith started me thinking about that. I might even be able to teach some Earthseed verses along with the reading and writing. Given any chance at all, teaching is what I would choose to do. Even if I have to take other kinds of work to get enough to eat, I can teach. If I do it well, it'll draw people to me, to Earthseed. All successful life is adaptable, opportunistic, tenacious, interconnected, and fecund. Understand this, use it, shape God. I wrote that verse a few months ago. It's true like all the verses. It seems more true than ever now, more useful to me when I'm afraid. I finally got a title for my book of Earthseed verses, Earthseed, the Book of the Living. There are the Tibetan and Egyptian books of the dead. Dad has copies of them. I've never heard of anything called a book of the living, but I wouldn't be surprised to discover that there is something. I don't care. I'm trying to speak, to write the truth. I'm trying to be clear. I'm not interested in being fancy or even original. Clarity and truth will be plenty. If I can only achieve them. If it happens that there are other people outside somewhere preaching my truth, I'll join them. Otherwise, I'll adapt where I must, take what opportunities I can find or make, hang on, gather students, and teach. And that's it for tonight.